Imagine flying in a spacecraft in a cloud of asteroids at high speed. You dodge one, one more, and then hit the gas pedal to the floor and crash into an asteroid at full speed on purpose. This is exactly what NASA is going to do in the near future. The entire mission will begin at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California on November 24th. Let's follow it step by step. So, the Falcon 9 booster rocket is already on the launch pad. It's as tall as a 22-story building, or 11 giraffes. And it can get about 8 tons of cargo into orbit. So, you could send a big elephant into space and a supply of food for it. Countdown. 3, 2, 1, ignition! Smoke clouds everywhere, and the rocket begins to gain altitude. Nine engines are working at full power to accelerate the rocket. At its peak, it reaches speeds 10 times faster than the speed of sound. And then the rocket engines shut down, and the rocket's first stage undocks to return to Earth. A couple of seconds later, the second stage receives the ignition command. It turns on its one engine and climbs even higher to orbit. The cargo capsule then opens and releases the DART spacecraft. DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Once released, the spaceship deploys two large solar panels. It'll convert solar energy into electrical energy to power a revolutionary ion engine. Conventional engines create thrust by burning tons of fuel and ejecting it outward. The rocket itself is essentially pushing off the emitted gases. The ion engine will not burn fuel. It'll use a strong electric field to accelerate the ionized gas. Like conventional rockets, it'll eject this gas and create thrust by repelling it. And though the ion engine produces less thrust, it can accelerate the spacecraft to higher speeds. So regular rocket engines have an excellent performance on the road. They push the pedal to the metal, burning a bunch of fuel, while the ion engine slowly accelerates. But when a conventional rocket needs to make a refueling stop, the ion spacecraft will whiz past the regular one at insane speeds. So the DART spacecraft begins its year-long journey. By comparison, a flight to Mars would take about seven months. Fast forward one year ahead, and we've arrived. This is the asteroid Didymos. The far point of its orbit is two astronomical units from our star. That's two Earth-Sun distances. At this point, the Sun begins to pull the asteroid back, and then it approaches the closest point to the star, one Earth-Sun distance. That is, its orbit lies very close to the orbit of our planet. Didymos made its closest approach to Earth at a distance of about 4.8 million miles. That's 20 times farther than the Moon's orbit. It takes 770 days to complete one such revolution around the Sun. So, Didymos is not considered a hazardous asteroid, but in the future, it'll approach the Earth even closer. And the consequences of a collision with it could be catastrophic, given its size. It's bigger than two Empire State Buildings, and it rotates at a rate of one revolution in two hours and 15 minutes. So it has a tremendous amount of energy. Plus, it has an asteroid companion. It's a small pebble 520 feet wide. It's like 12 school buses or 10 train cars. Its orbital period, that is, the time it takes the pebble to make a complete circle around the asteroid, is about 11.9 hours. NASA believes that asteroids up to 80 feet wide are likely to burn up completely in our atmosphere due to friction with the air, so they're not hazardous. Asteroids between 80 feet and half a mile in size will not burn completely and could cause severe damage. And asteroids over half a mile have the potential to wipe out large cities or even entire states. In that sense, we can consider Didymos potentially hazardous. So we're going to test one way of defending against asteroids on it. Kinetic impact. That's why we sent DART here. So our spacecraft is going to hit an asteroid. Only not its main body, but its little companion. DART is already moving toward it at about 4 miles per second. At that speed, a trip from New York to Washington, D.C. would take less than a minute. And a trip across the United States from coast to coast would take about 10 minutes. DART is getting close. Three seconds to impact, two, one, bam! The spacecraft crashes into the asteroid at full speed. What are your predictions? Asteroid explodes and is blown to pieces? Or asteroid flies off the main body into space like a billiard ball? Well, scientists predict that this collision will reduce the speed of this small asteroid by a fraction of a percent, but it'll still be enough to reduce its orbital period by a few minutes. Then our telescopes on Earth will be able to study the effects of the collision in more detail. 
And to learn even more, we'll send another spacecraft to Didymos on another mission. This is Hera. It'll be launched in 2024 and is scheduled to arrive at Didymos around 2027. This spacecraft will carry a bunch of research equipment to assess the collision damage done by DART. When it arrives, Hera will take many pictures of the small asteroid, including a fresh impact crater. Hera will also be carrying two CubeSats. These are miniature space probes, smaller than a shoebox. It'll launch these mini satellites, and they will make an even closer approach to the asteroid. They will study this space rock for three to six months. At the end of the mission, one of them will attempt to land on the asteroid's surface to learn even more about its composition and internal structure. It's also possible Hera will carry a mini impactor. This thing will have to make another impact on the asteroid. Then scientists will be able to evaluate the difference in impacts with a large spacecraft and a small one, and understand how we can defend against asteroids in the future. In theory, we don't need to send a giant rocket to a dangerous asteroid to destroy it. A single strike might be enough to shift the trajectory of the asteroid slightly. On a cosmic scale, changing the trajectory, even by a fraction, would dramatically change the asteroid's finish point. But kinetic impact is not the only way to deal with hazardous asteroids. Check out the gravity tractor. For this technique, we need to send a spacecraft toward the asteroid too. Only, it won't crash into it. It'll have to go into its orbit. Any asteroid has a force of attraction, and it'll pull the spacecraft toward it. But the spacecraft's engines will keep it at the same altitude. So the asteroid itself will start attracting to the spacecraft. This method is reliable enough, but it takes a long time. And it'll only work if we detect a potentially hazardous asteroid many years before it arrives at Earth. We should have enough time to send a spacecraft to the asteroid and then carry out an asteroid tractor technique. The other option is a laser. When an asteroid is found, we need to aim a powerful laser beam at it. It'll heat up a certain point on the asteroid, causing the material there to evaporate. This is where physics comes into play. The material on the asteroid evaporates upwards. It makes the asteroid itself move downward. Just like our rocket engines work, the burning fuel is ejected one way and the spacecraft moves the other. We can also use solar power instead of lasers. To do that, we need to build a big space station, which would be equipped with a lot of magnifying glasses. Have you ever tried to burn letters on a wooden surface with a magnifying glass? Well, we'd be doing the same thing, but with an asteroid. The space station will have to focus lots of the sun's rays into one point on the asteroid. Again, the material evaporates because of the high temperature, and this causes the asteroid to change its trajectory slightly so that it flies past our planet. How about foil? That's right, we can avoid a collision with an asteroid by using ordinary foil. We would have to wrap the asteroid in the same reflective material. Then the asteroid won't absorb the sun's rays, but will instead reflect them. This creates a little pressure on the surface of the asteroid. It's as if the sun's rays are pushing the asteroid, and it'll be able to change its trajectory. And not the most obvious but reliable option is conventional rocket engines. We can put several powerful engines on the asteroid. This would create thrust and change the trajectory of the asteroid. And if there are enough engines, we can even take control of the asteroid. So when a bigger space rock appears on the horizon, we'll turn on our engines and point the asteroid straight at it. Such a collision can completely destroy even a very large asteroid. And it would make for one epic light show. On August 20th, 1977, the most ambitious space mission took off from Earth. The main goal of Voyager 2 was to study the outer solar system up close. It became possible because of a rare alignment of planets. Voyager 2 was supposed to study all the gas giants of the solar system – Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Astronomers also hoped it would be able to find and explore the edge of the solar system. Since Voyager 2 was built for interstellar travel, the probe was equipped with a large 12-foot-wide antenna. It allowed the spaceship to send the data it gathered back to Earth. During its journey, the space probe discovered a 14th moon of Jupiter. Voyager 2 was the only spaceship to study all four giant planets from up close. It was the first human-made object to fly past Uranus, where it found two new rings and ten new moons. 
Voyager 2 also flew by Neptune and noticed its great dark spot. That's a colossal spinning storm in the planet's southern hemisphere. The storm is the size of Earth and moves at a speed of 1,500 miles per hour. These winds are the strongest ever recorded on any planet of the solar system. In the history of space exploration, only five spacecraft have managed to leave the gravitational pull of the solar system. Those were Pioneer 10 and 11, Voyager 1 and 2, and New Horizons. People launch thousands of objects into space. These objects easily overcome Earth's gravity. But the Sun is around 300,000 times as massive as our home planet. That's why its gravitational pull is way more difficult to find. Even more impressively, Voyager 2 is the second human-made object in history to reach the space between stars after passing through the heliosphere. That's a bubble of magnetic fields and particles produced by the Sun and protecting the solar system. Two years after its launch, Voyager 2 started transmitting the first images of Jupiter. The space probe provided scientists with much-needed information about Io and Europa, some of the largest of Jupiter's moons. Then the space mission passed by the gas giant itself. The distance between the spacecraft and the planet was around 400,000 miles. That's when the probe noticed some changes in the shape and color of the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous, long-lived storm system, like a hurricane on Earth, but much, much larger. Two years later, Voyager 2 reached Saturn. It discovered spokes and kinks in some of the planet's rings. While the spacecraft was flying behind and up past the gas giant, it passed through the plane of Saturn's rings. At that time, Voyager's speed was around 8 miles per second. For several minutes, the probe was hit by thousands of micron-sized grains of dust. This kept shifting the probe's direction, and its control jets had to fire many times to stabilize the vehicle. After Voyager 2 explored Uranus and Neptune, it headed out of the solar system. Its instruments were put in low power to save energy. In August 2007, the spacecraft passed the terminal shock. It's the boundary marking the outer limit of the sun's influence. Here, the solar wind slows down. In the summer of 2013, the probe reached interstellar space. Now, when it comes to sending and receiving signals in space, there are three factors you should keep in mind. Distance, power, and time. The farther away a spacecraft is, the farther a signal has to travel before it reaches it and the longer it takes for this signal to catch up with the spacecraft. And when it finally gets there, it's extremely weak. Another problem is that once the spacecraft is launched, it can't be upgraded. It's literally stuck with the technology it was outfitted with. Plus, such spaceships as Voyager 2 are powered by radioactive fuel. When special material radioactively decays, it releases heat that gets converted into electricity. Unfortunately, the more material decays away, the less power the spacecraft has for receiving and transmitting radio signals. Despite this issue, we haven't lost the connection with Voyager 1 and 2. That's because new and more powerful technologies appear on Earth. Signals people send can reach much farther than before. That's why it was possible to stay in touch with Voyager 2, which entered interstellar space in 2018 and has already traveled almost 12 billion miles away from Earth. But in March 2020, the main piece of equipment that allowed scientists to exchange signals with the spaceship was switched off. After the communication with the spacecraft stopped, NASA spent around 11 months upgrading its deep space network and installing new hardware. The DSN is an international array of huge radio antennas that help astronomers on Earth communicate with interplanetary missions. These antennas are located in California, Madrid, and Canberra. The one used to keep in touch with Voyager 2 is a 230-foot wide dish in Canberra. This is the only equipment that can send commands that can reach the probe. This antenna, known as DSS-43, started operating in 1972, five years before Voyager 2 and 1 were launched. At that time, it was only 210 feet across. Since then, the dish has received a lot of repairs and upgrades. But these 11 months were the longest the antenna was offline. In October 2020, the antenna was finally ready for a trial after all the upgrades and repairs. The mission operators sent a set of commands to Voyager 2, and after many months of radio silence, the spacecraft returned the signal. The probe confirmed it had heard the call. After that, the spacecraft carried out the commands.
While the dish was offline, the mission operators could actually receive scientific data and health updates from Voyager 2. Astronomers kept getting data from interstellar space, the region outside the Sun's heliosphere. But they couldn't send any commands to the probe, since it had traveled too far away from Earth. The upgraded antenna received two new radio transmitters, and it was done just in time. One of the transmitters, that was used to communicate with Voyager 2, hadn't been replaced in almost 50 years. The antenna also got new cooling and heating equipment and other electronics necessary to support the advanced transmitters. Now, a curious thing about the Deep Space Network is that its radio antennas are positioned in a very precise way. They're spaced equally around the globe. This way, almost any spacecraft can stay in touch with at least one facility at all times. But Voyager 2 is an exception. In 1989, it made a close flyby of Triton, Neptune's moon. It was the only close encounter people had with the eighth planet of the solar system and its moon. By the way, Triton is the largest known object that is believed to be born in the Kuiper Belt. That's a donut-shaped ring around the Sun full of icy objects. Voyager 2 discovered Neptune's ring system and its tiny inner moons. The probe also gathered a lot of amazing information about Triton. For example, it became clear that the moon is covered in cryovolcanoes. Instead of spewing molten rock, these volcanoes spit ice consisting of water, ammonia, and methane. When the New Horizon spacecraft flew past Pluto more than 25 years later, it discovered the same phenomenon on the dwarf planet. Anyway, to make this detour, Voyager 2 had to travel over the gas giant's North Pole. But this changed the probe's trajectory, deflecting it southward relative to the planes of the planets. Since then, Voyager 2 has been moving in that direction. And now, the spacecraft is so far away that it's out of reach of the radio antennas in the Northern Hemisphere, those in Madrid and California. This makes DSS-43, which is located in the Southern Hemisphere, the only dish powerful enough and broadcasting just the right frequency to send commands to Voyager 2. Voyager 1, the probe's faster-traveling twin, didn't change its trajectory. After passing by Saturn, it took a different path. That's why now it can easily communicate with the two facilities in the Northern Hemisphere. The upgrade the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex has gone through can also benefit other space missions. For example, the Mars Perseverance rover that landed on the Red Planet on February 18, 2021. The dish will also be crucial for exploring other planets and the Moon. You're flying through space, dodging stars and black holes. Your speed is so great that you can get from one galaxy to another in just a few minutes. Sound far-fetched? Well, all this can become a reality because NASA has already tested the technology that might allow us to travel faster than the speed of light. Let's look at the space fleet people have now. To fly into space, we use conventional rockets carrying tons of fuel and oxygen. These two substances get mixed and ignited. Fire bursts out of the rockets. The exhaust gases move downward and the rockets move upward, as if pushing off of them. That's how jet propulsion works. This way, we can make the rocket move at almost 5 miles per second. At that speed, you could cross the United States from coast to coast in a mere 8.5 minutes. But if we talk about space, that's very slow. A trip to a neighboring planet, like Mars, takes about 7 months. And a trip to the edge of the solar system would take about 35 years. That's how long it took the Voyager space probe, launched in 1977, to get there. But we want to travel between stars and galaxies. And the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away from our home. That would take about 73,000 years to get there. That's longer than intelligent human civilization has even existed. And if you wanted to travel across the whole Milky Way galaxy, which is 100,000 light years wide, it would take you about 1.7 trillion years. By comparison, the entire universe is 14 billion years old. People just travel too slowly. But even at the speed of light, it would still take 4.2 years to travel to the nearest star. And you'd spend 2.5 million years to get to the nearby Andromeda galaxy. But we can't accelerate like this. That's because the laws of physics say that an object with mass can't travel at the speed of light. A photon of light has an infinitely small weight. But if you want to accelerate even a tiny grain of sand to that speed, you'd need an infinite amount of energy. 
maybe even more than the entire universe has. But scientists might have found a way around the laws of physics. To create thrust, you need to push off of something. Ships need water. Planes push off of the air. Rockets use the fuel they burn. But this thing, the M-Drive, works in a different way. A powerful magnetron, like the one in your microwave, sends waves into this cone. It's a resonator. It makes the waves inside bounce off of one of the walls and hit the others. As a result, we have a weak force at the narrow end of the cone and a strong force at the wide end. And if we analyze this powerful force, we'll see that it is directed toward the wide end of the cone. So, the thrust will be in the opposite direction. Now, let's make this model much, much larger and put the M-Drive on a spaceship. The narrow end of the cone faces up. The wide end is turned downward. The magnetron starts to work. The resonator creates thrust and the rocket takes off. It makes no noise and doesn't emit any harmful gases at all. This mechanism can accelerate the rocket much faster than we do with tons of fuel. In theory, we could even reach the speed of light. Sounds great, but in reality, it isn't. Although the inventor of this device tried to prove the M-Drive works, no independent experiment around the world has shown positive results. NASA sponsored the construction of such a machine in a laboratory, but it didn't create any thrust during the research. Another option that would allow us to travel much faster than the speed of light is the AlQB air bubble. A Mexican scientist has figured out a way to use the general theory of relativity without breaking the laws of physics. Let's say we have a spaceship on a space-time blanket, and it needs to make a trip to the other end of the blanket. Instead of just moving from point A to point B hundreds of thousands of light years away, the ship starts pulling the blanket toward itself. As the spacecraft folds the blanket, point B moves toward it. Now the ship needs to travel a much shorter distance to point B. It makes a quick trip and then straightens the time-space blanket back to normal. Voila! So such a spaceship doesn't need powerful engines that will burn tons of fuel and oxygen. It would move in a kind of bubble. But the hardest part is creating such a bubble. To do this, we would need an amount of energy roughly equal to the mass energy of all of Jupiter. That's more than we can produce on Earth. And still, scientists are planning to test this technology on a small space probe the size of Voyager. But this experiment might last for decades or even centuries. Now scientists are trying to reach at least 20% of the speed of light using a laser. And they're planning to get to Proxima Centauri in about 30 years. It's likely to happen like this. A mothership will launch from Earth. It'll carry thousands of fingernail-sized space probes. After reaching orbit, the mothership will launch the probes into space. Each probe will then deploy a sail, a thin, reflective piece of material the size of a parking lot. Then, people will focus a powerful laser beam from Earth directly onto the probe's sails. This will give them an acceleration 1,000 times as strong as the acceleration of free fall on Earth. One by one, the probes will launch and head for their destination. We won't even have to maintain that laser beam all the time. If you turn off the engines of a regular ship on the water, it'll start to lose speed due to friction with the water. But space is an almost perfect vacuum. There's literally nothing there. So there's no friction. All we have to do is accelerate the probes to the needed speed. At 20% of the speed of light, these probes could reach the sun in just 40 minutes. But instead, they will head for the star Proxima Centauri. After about 30 years of travel, four more years will pass before we get a signal from the probes. There are several exoplanets in this system, and some scientists hope to find at least traces of life there. But this sail technology can be used in space even without a powerful laser. We can use the sun. If we create a sail the size of a soccer field and unfold it in space, it'll start catching the sun's rays. And since the surface of the sail is reflective, the rays will bounce off the sail. This will create thrust and propel the spacecraft. One disadvantage of this technology is that we can only use it inside the solar system. In cold interstellar space, the sail won't be able to catch the sun's rays or solar wind. Another candidate for faster-than-light travel is an ion thruster. Like a conventional rocket, a spacecraft with ion thrusters would be propelled by gas ejected outward. Only, in this case, the gas would be ejected not because of fuel combustion, but because of an electric field. We'd need to create a powerful electric field inside the engine. 
particles of gas passing through this electric field would get accelerated and ejected outside. This would create thrust. And although the acceleration in such an engine would be many times weaker than in a conventional rocket, the ion engine would be able to reach higher speeds. NASA was planning to build an ion-powered spacecraft to fly to Jupiter. Ion engines consume a lot of energy, so the ship was to be equipped with a nuclear reactor and lots of solar panels. Eight large engines were supposed to accelerate the spacecraft to about 56 miles per second. At this speed, the trip from New York to London would take one minute. So far, this technology has been actively tested on different space probes, but it can't provide a solution to how to travel faster than the speed of light. Perhaps people will still be able to travel between galaxies in conventional rockets, but they'll need to use some sort of shortcuts called wormholes. So, back to our space-time blanket. Point A lies at one end, and point B is at the other. Instead of traveling across the entire blanket for millions of years, you can simply fold it. Then, point B will be right above point A, and you can quickly get there through a short tunnel between them. Such tunnels are called wormholes. Some scientists believe that wormholes can be inside black holes. But there are two problems here. The nearest black hole is 1,500 light years away. So a trip there would take eons. The second problem is the hole's gravity. Black holes have the strongest gravitational pull of any object in the universe. Their gravity can crush any spacecraft. That's because the gravitational force increases with every inch you move closer to the black hole center. And the force affecting the nose of the spaceship will be much stronger than the force that affects the tail. The spaceship will stretch out like spaghetti and get torn apart. But there's a theory claiming that a spacecraft or even a person can survive falling into a black hole. But only if the black hole is super massive, like the ones that lie in the centers of galaxies. They can be millions and billions of times heavier than the sun. But even though they're heavier, they're also bigger in size. This means gravity probably doesn't increase so fast there. You or your spacecraft might not turn into spaghetti and might even get to see what's at the heart of the black hole.